Hi, we're going to deal with five themes in the Haggadah. You know, much of this material will be able to be used not only at the Seder itself, but hopefully throughout the holiday. Some of them are shorter themes, some of them are a little bit more elongated, elaborate. First theme we're going to talk about is the paragraph of Halach Ma'anya. What's difficult about Halach Ma'anya? You've got a Haggadah that's in Hebrew, and then you've got this paragraph, Halach Ma'anya, that's in Aramaic. What is that? That's the first thing. Second thing is just look at the translation of the terms. Anyone who's hungry, call dichvin yese v'yechol. Anyone who's hungry, come on and eat and participate in our meal. Call ditzrich yese v'yifsach. Anyone who needs to be part of the Korban Pesach, please come and partake, be a member of our Korban Pesach. Well, there's a problem. You're sitting at the Seder. Your door is closed. You know, this is not Kos Eliyahu, the cup of Elijah, where you open your door. Isn't it a little bit disingenuous? Isn't it a little bit too late to be inviting someone to the Seder at this point in time? That's number one. Number two is halachically, you can't say call, call ditzrich yesei v'yivsach. Anyone who needs to be part of our roasted lamb, our korban pesach, come participate. We know there's a halacha min ha-menuyin. The only ones who can be part of the korban pesach are those who were designated to be part of that korban pesach prior to the shechita, b'shas shechita. Well, the animal's been slaughtered the, or, the afternoon of the 14th. This is now the night of the 15th. This is Seder night. It's too late. So what kind of an invitation is that? So again, what is this? It seems disingenuous. It's a little too late. And why is it in Aramaic? So the approach that we're going to take is the approach of Ravaran Khan. What Ravaran Khan said was the following. Why, for instance, is this Aramaic? Because Aramaic was the language of the Bayashani. That was the language of the street, of what the common people spoke. Yes, the Mishnah was written in, so to speak, the educational language of Hebrew, but we know that the vernacular of the population was Aramaic. I mean, just to give you an example to prove that, going back to Yom Kippur, what's the, what did they do with the Kohen Gadol to keep the Kohen Gadol up all night so that he would not have a nocturnal emission and be invalidated to serve as the Kohen Gadol the next day in the Mikdash? So if you had a Talmud Chacham, a scholar, he would teach. We all know on Shavuos night, it's much easier if you're doing the teaching than if you're passively learning. So that he would teach to keep himself awake. The problem was at the end of the period of the Bayashani, they would buy the position from the Romans, different Kohanim who were not educated, who were not from a, meritocr from a point of view of meritocracy, were not worthy to be the Kohen Gadol. They would buy the position. So they couldn't teach. They weren't scholars or educated. The problem was you couldn't keep them awake having them study Shmuel or part of the, let's say, the narrative of Tanakh because they weren't familiar with the Hebrew. They could read Hebrew, but they weren't familiar with it. So what do they do? If you look in the Mishnayos in the first parak of Masech the Yuma, what do you have there? They are doing what? They're learning Sefer Daniel, Sefer Ezra. What's Ezra Nehemiah? What's Daniel? I mean, that's sort of a strange choice for Yom Kippur night. No because those are the two books of Tanakh that were written in Aramaic. They're the two books of Tanakh were the vernacular, so to speak. That way they could read it, understand it, keep themselves awake. Just using that as a proof. So this is the language that people are meant to understand. It's the language that's spoken, so to speak, on the street in the market. What Rav Khan said is, this paragraph, Halach Ma'anya, you know where its place is? Two, three weeks, the week of, leading up to Pesach, going around and saying, look, you know, you're, you're all alone. Why don't you join our family? Or you have someone who financially, it's very expensive for them to make a Seder. Please come and partake, be part of our Seder. The Rambam, and this is a key Rambam, it's one of those Rambams where there's certain Rambams in the Mishnah Torah you need to memorize that have to be part of our lingua, our, our, our lingua franco. They have to be just shgura befiv. And this Rambam is Perak vav halacha chaf. Perak Vav Halacha Chav of Hilchas Yom Tov. One there says the following. What's the definition of Simchas Yom Tov? It's not what we would have thought. Oh, the family sitting around, a beautiful sitting around the Seder. Everybody's dressed nice. We have beautiful china, you know, beautiful crystal, silver. It's wonderful. Nothing could be nicer. No. The Rambam says based upon the define what Yom Tov is. The Sukkim that we read from Parshas Re'e, the last day Shavuos, the last day Pesach, because of Simchas Torah, we don't read it the last day of, of, of the Sukkot vacation, of the Sukkot holiday, we read it on Shemini Atzeres. And what is that? It says that 
there's an obligation on Yom Tov to be misameach acherim. The ger, the yasom, the almana, the levi. What does that mean? No, it's, it's not just about you, your children, your spouse. Yom Tov is about, what is the ger? Someone who doesn't have a family. Doesn't have, you know, basic pieces of real estate. You know, may not have the financial means. The widow, the orphan. The levy, again, people who don't have the kind of background families to take care of them, the kind of financial means and resources, make sure they're part of your table. Make sure they're part of your Yom Tov. Extend that family. That's really Simchus Yom Tov, to be misameach acherim. And the Rambam has a huge phrase, a fascinating <coughs> phrase. We talk about being misameach acherim. What does he say? He says, if all you have is your family, ain't simchas yamtov. That's not simchas yamtov. Ela simchas kreso. You know what that is? It's the joy of the belly, of the gut. Simchas kreso from the word keres. So again, the ultimate experience of yamtov is to provide for others. Yamtov is the great equalizer. When we all experience a, a meaningful, a meaningful experience, and the Rambam in that halacha, parak vav halacha chaf, he says the following. The Rambam says it's not just the aniyim, the financial poor, but it's those people who, let's say, are spiritually poor, who maybe they wouldn't, they, they might be able to buy and sell you, they, could, they can afford it, but the, but the thing is they don't know how to make a Yom Tov meal. They don't know how to make a sukkah or have a sukkah. They don't know how to make a nice seder. They should be at your seder. Let them experience it. Because educationally, spiritually, it will be a profound moment for them. And then he talks about the Mare Nefesh, the Umlalim and the Mare Nefesh. Again, this is someone who financially they can afford a Seder better than you and I. But you know what the problem is? Who wants to be alone? Who wants to be depressed on Yom Tov? A Shabbos meal. It's the worst time to be depressed, to sit all by yourself on a Friday night. Someone who may be divorced and not have a family nearby. Someone who's just down, you know, has lost loved ones and they're all alone. Their role on Yom Tov is to be together with us. They have to be with us. No Jew should be left behind for a Yom Tov meal. And this is the idea of Halach Ma'anya, to go out there and to find people to make it a real Yom Tov, a real Simchas Yom Tov. And the time to do that is not Seder night. It's too late then. The time to do that is in advance. So why is it in the Haggadah, Seder night? It's, you know, we say like, a shtoch in the kishkas. You know, it's a little zetz in the kishkas. Hey, you're sitting here. For this to be a real Seder, for this to be the ideal Seder, you want to make sure, you really want to make sure that it's not just about, you know, you, friends and family, MCI, no. It's about taking care of the umlalim, as the Rambam says, the mari nefesh. And it's there to remind us of what the Seder is supposed to be. That's the idea. And that's why, of course, why it's in the vernacular, in a language that people can understand. Because it was meant to be said in the market, on the street, you know, in the neighborhood, etc. Second theme, we talk about the, the famous Mishnah that we quote in the Haggadah, In each and every generation, in each and every generation, we see ourselves, we see ourselves as if we're leaving Egypt. The Rambam has actually an interesting girsa, we demonstrate. You've seen sometimes the Svardi uh, Seder where they, they, put the, they take the satchels over the back. Chayev Adam laharos es atzmo, ki ilu hu yatsa ata me mitzrayim. It's as if he's leaving now from Egypt. What's the idea there? What's the idea there? I'm going to start with the end and work our way back. There's a famous story they tell about Napoleon Bonaparte. I've heard two versions of the story. Did it happen actually in France, or was it during the war when he was warring against Russia? Did it happen somewhere in Belarus, you know, in, in what we call white Russia, in the Litvish community? Well, what happens? It's Tisha B'av. And what's happening? Every Jew on Tisha B'av, we know, is not just telling a history lesson about Tisha B'av. We're, once, we're living the tragedy. We're reliving the tragedy. We're re-experiencing the tragedy, and halachically, every Jew is a status, status of an onen. 
Mi yishamei sumotel lefanav, the Gemara in Bracha says. The Gemara in Moed Katan refers to. In other words, literally, we've, we've suffered the loss. We're at the funeral. The kinos, starting with your miyahu and eicha and asof asifem in the morning, the haftorah, and then continuing throughout Jewish history with the kinos of the kalir and the kinos of the great Rishonim. What are we doing? We're, those are, those are hespedim. We're attending the funeral. We're reliving the death. We're re-experiencing the tragedy. That's true halachically throughout the experience of the three weeks building up to the day of Tisha B'av. We literally are re-experiencing the loss and the tragedy. And supposedly Napoleon, you know, he said, what are these people doing? It's the middle of the summer. They're sitting there and they're weeping and they're wailing and they, they're disheveled. You know, they haven't shaved. So he sent one of his people and, and they explained to him what is the ninth of Av, what is Tisha B'av. You know, and this was the day with the destruction of the Jewish community, our, the, the heart and soul of the Jewish world, the Beis HaMikdash. The first time at the hands of the Babylonians, the second time at the hands of the Romans. And he supposedly said, any people that has not forgotten their past, but re-experiences and relives their past, that people ultimately will return to Jerusalem. That nation will return to their holy land, to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is not a memory. Jerusalem is alive and well. It's a reality. And he got it. Napoleon Bonaparte got it. That's been the experience of Tisha B'av. And that's the experience of Seder night. The exodus of Egypt is not some historical event. It's not some like phenomena that existed at a time in history. We re-experience. We relive the experience itself. It's our exodus. And I'm gonna, we're going to use a few examples from the Seder. What do we say? We say Hallel, Seder night. What are you saying Hallel on the Seder night for? We don't say Hallel at night. Hallel is a commemorative statement or articulation of Tehillim to commemorate certain events in history. I'll give you an example. We say Hallel on Hanukkah. You say Hallel on the Yom Im Tovim. You know, like the History Channel. This date in history. So how do we commemorate this date in history? By saying Hallel, expressing gratitude to the Almighty. Well, what's happening here? What are we doing here? It's not the same Hallel. There's no bracha in this Hallel. It's taking place at night. We interrupt the Hallel, right? You have the Hallel before the, the meal, part of the second cup. You have a Hallel after the meal, part of the fourth cup. What is this? We're sitting down. We're not standing for the Hallel like we do normally. I mean, imagine saying the Hallel in shul. You know, and you say, you know what? Let's take a break in the middle of Hallel. We're going out for Kiddush Club. Or we're going to take a break in the middle of Hallel. You know, we're going to have some, a bite to eat. You don't do that. It's not what you do. What is this? So this Hallel, the Brisker Rav says, this is Hallel al Hanes. There's two types of Hallel in Judaism. There's commemorative Hallel, that's said is part of the formal tefillah experience. And then when we encounter providence, the response of the Jew is to say Hallel. The classic, the paradigm, is Az Yashir Moshe. The Shiraz Hayam. When we encountered Providence, where the Almighty literally saved our lives and destroyed the Egyptian military, what was the Jews' response? Shiraz Hayam. And that's true throughout. Whenever we encounter Providence, the response is what's called Halal al Hanes. We are encountering Providence. It's not just about what happened to our progenitors or our forefathers. This is our encounter with Providence. It's our nace. It's our geula. Look at what happens. It's a transition in the second cup, in the Magid section of, of the Seder, where first we do the analysis and the study of the events of what happened. That auspicious night in Jewish history, the, 15th, the very first 15th of Nisan. But then it transitions into what? Not about what happened to our progenitors, geula savoseinu, but it's ge'alanu. The bracha that we make on the second coast, asher ge'alanu v'ge'al avoseinu. It's our redemption. We are experiencing it. That's why we say halal al hanes. L'fichach chanachnu chayavim lahodos lahalel l'shabeach l'fa'er v'gomer. What's the idea of haseba? You know, the Rav Yah, other Rishonim say, we can't really do haseba today because it's not like we have these you know, these benches or these couches, I apologize, beds or couches like Julius Caesar had, reclining, having a meal that way. 
if you go under Yeshivat HaKotel, they think they discovered that was the home of the Kohen Gadol in the gorgeous mosaic floor, except for where? The place where they pl positioned these beds that they would eat over. And there was a whole order of how the beds were positioned. So it's hard to do a Haseba when you're sitting upright in a chair. You know, we try, but what's the point? Why, is, why do you have to have a Haseba? What's the obligation of Haseba? To demonstrate that we're free. We're no longer slaves. We're now the masters of our own time. We demonstrate that. What's the arbacosos, four cups of wine? Again, to demonstrate. We're demonstrating that we have, it's our emancipation, it's our freedom. And this whole idea of meziga, right? You, you water it down just to the point where you like it. Mosgin kos rishon, mosgin kos sheni. And you go to you have the wine and cheese tasting events at the shuls in advance of Seder. You get the wine that's just right for you. A fine schmecker, what is the idea of that? We're demonstrating, we're reliving that tonight we are free. Tonight, it's our destiny that has changed. It's not just co a commemoration. It's a reenactment. It's a reenactment. You know, the, the famous question that, that the, the Salvechik family from Reb Chaim down that they deal with, what's the difference between the mitzvah of Zechiras Yitzias Mitzrayim? Each and every night of the year in Shema and in e every morning in the year, we mention the exodus of Egypt. We never, ever forget about our past, our history. So what's the difference Seder night when we do this? The mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And there are many differences. One of the differences given is, what's Zechira? Zechira is a commemoration. It's, it's remembering a historical event. Sipur is not just a monologue where we state a historical fact. Sipur is something that we experience, that we develop, that we, we, we develop this whole idea that it's not just a, a, a historical commemoration. We relive it. We experience it. Whether it's through the reclining of the Haseba, the four cups of wine, the halal al the, the, that we say. Pesach Doros, the whole notion of the Seder that we have. So on one hand, yes, it's a reenactment. It's a reenactment of Pesach Mitzrayim. The whole Seder with the Pesach and the Matzah and the Maror, it's a reenactment. But on the other hand, it's not just a reenactment. It's our Seder. It's our Pesach. That's a mistake, you know, the Ben Harasha says. If you look at the Beis HaLevi, the Beis HaLevi speaks about the Ben Harasha. Why is it called a, you know, Russia here doesn't mean someone who's wicked or evil. If he was so wicked or so evil, first of all, he wouldn't show up to the Seder night. Secondly, you think you're going to invite him if he's so wicked or so evil? Russia here is the halachic term of Russia. Russia is a sinner, someone who's an avaryan, who makes mistakes, you know, who, who violates the law. He's an avaryan. But what's the taina? What's the issue? Maha vodas hazos lachem. What is the Russia saying to the parents according to the Beis Halevi? Look, I understand it. In the old days, you know, the Korban Pesach, it was there, it was the Egyptians' pagan god, and they had to demonstrate, you know, the nullification, bitul avodah zara. But give me a break. That was thousands of years ago. What does that have to do with us? Why do we have to eat dinner so late? You know, it's the NBA playoffs. I'd like to sit and watch a ball game afterwards. They're going to be showing the Ten Commandments, you know, for the 50th time on TV. I'd like to see that. But to sit up late at night until you finally sit down and eat, and then you constipate me with this matzah, you know, and the, the amounts you make me eat. I, I'm, I'm ready. I'm chalishing for a delicious dinner that you've been preparing for the last few days. And, you know, and I can't even eat it because you stuffed me with matzah and maror, and by the time I get to the main course, I'm not even hungry. What are you doing? Give me a break. Be very nice. We'll spend it. We'll make a few moments of commemoration. We'll say a few words, and let's get to the meal. That's the way to do it. No. This is we are our experience. In the why are we experiencing it? Because when you relive history and you experience history, you don't forget. Then it, then it, it shapes you. It defines you. It leaves like a, psychologically an indelible imprint in your very persona. And that's the experience of Bechal Dor Vador. Each and every generation, we see ourselves as leaving Egypt. We, according to the Rambam, we demonstrate as if we're leaving Egypt. Ge'alanu, it's our emancipation. It's our, so to speak, redemption. Not just our progenitors. Another theme, well, this is a little shorter one, is What's the role of Kriyas Yamsuf? If you look, for instance, at the Rambam's Haggadah, 
The Rambam does not have a word of Kriyas Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea. How many miracles happened at the sea? Was it 50? Was it 200? Was it 250? None of that is there. None of that is, is, is in his Haggadah. We understand why. According to the Rambam, we understand very well why. Because you know why? It's the experience of the night of the 15th of Nisan. The splitting of the sea and the destruction of the Egyptian military, that takes place the last day of Pesach. Six days later, that takes place. This is the experience of that night, the night of the 15th. And, as, and Kriyas Yamsuf doesn't play a role in it. So why do we, you know, we who follow the, the Chachmei Ashkenaz, we quote these different midrashim about the experience at the sea and the miracles that took place, and we say Dayenu. What, what's the logic behind what we're doing? The idea is, and you could, you could have a different approach. There are other possibilities. But what ultimately made us free, I don't mean legally free, I'm talking about psychologically free, was Kriyas Yamsuf. We weren't free till Kriyas Yamsuf. Because as long as the slave has the fear, and lives with the nightmare, that those former captors are going to come back and they're going to hunt us down. They've got the weapons, they've got the sophisticated, state-of-the-art weaponry, the chariots. You know, as long as there's that fear that they're going to come hunt us down and bring back their free labor source, we're not free. And, and what's fascinating is the famous miracle that takes place. One of the miracles of Yamsuf is what? That even though the chariots and even though the soldiers were weighted down with the kind of metal they were weighted with, they didn't sink. The law of physics say they should sink. But what? The dead bodies drifted up on shore. Why was that necessary? Why was that detail of miracle necessary? Because as long as the Jews would think that we escaped on this side, when the walls collapsed, the walls of water came tumbling in, we got out one side, they got out the other. And they're going to come and they're going to hunt us down. Then the Jews could never be free. We needed a sense of closure. We needed a sense of finality. We needed to know that, that justice was done and that they would not come get us. That was the clincher of our emancipation, was Kriyas Yamsuf. And without that, it wasn't a real freedom. Without that, we could never take the step forward psychologically of becoming a free people, a people of, of confidence, a, a people that can move forward. You know, you have this in, in many ways. When you have the, the, the fear of someone who's, they've, they've created a PPO, a you know, protection order, against someone who's been abusive to them. And there's always that fear that that abuser will come and get them. You have that, God forbid, you know, with, with cancer. We know that cancer can come back. All you need is a few cells that were not destroyed. You know, they can metastasize. You never have that sense of closure. And just in, in general, why it was so crucial, the role of the, the, the Eichmann trial was so crucial for the Jewish people to move past the Holocaust. Why? Because when they see the sense of justice and when they see that the oppressors, whether it was the Nuremberg trials, whether it was what happened you know, at, at the camps when the camps were liberated, to see that those oppressors we're getting their due, and to know it, and to know that it's over, and that they've been stopped, and that they've been, been put, put out, whether incarcerated, killed, whatever, there's a sense of closure. That was the role of Kriyas Yamsuf, and that's why, even though it's not the experience of the night of the 15th, it's, in, it's intrinsically linked to the whole experience of the Geula. Next theme is a shorter one. Lashana haba Yerushalayim. We all sing it, right? At the end of the Seder, we say Nirza, that we should accept this Seder. And then we sing, next year it should be in Jerusalem. Basic question. What is that? Twice a year we sing Lashana haba Yerushalayim. After Yom Kippur and after the Seder. What's the common denominator? What's the Tzad Hashava, the common denominator between Yom Kippur and the Seder? That we say Lashana haba Yerushalayim. What is that? So the approach that we're going to take is the approach of one of the Talmidim of the Rav, Rav Yehuda Silver. He took this approach. He said the following. If you look at what we observe without a Beis HaMikdash, 
without the whole nation in Yerushalayim. Most of what we observe, for instance, let's start with Shabbos. A Shabbos in Alaska or a Shabbos in Yerushalayim is still primarily the same Shabbos. Halachically, the spiritual content, it's primarily the same Shabbos. Even Rosh Hashanah, the shofar, Shavuos, the Isser Malacha, Sukkot with the Lulav and Esrog and we're living in a Sukkah. It's true, we don't have the mitzvah of Elias HaRegel. We're lacking that component. But, but Kwa Hilchus Sukkah, Kwa Hilchus Rosh Hashanah, Kwa Hilchus Shabbos, it's a Shabbos. But there's two times a year you don't have that. One is Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur without the Beis HaMikdash. Look at Masech Yuma. Seven of eight chapters, seven out of eight prakim deal with what? They deal with all the various mitzvahs from Parshas Acharei Mos, the whole system of how Yom Kippur is supposed to be observed. Going into the Holy of Holies with the, in, with the Ketoros and the two goats, the Hagrola, the, the lottery over to the two goats, which will go lifnaim lifnim into the Sanctum Sanctorium, which will go off the cliff, the Sa'ir Lazozel, the Par. All of the multiple, multiple mitzvahs that apply to Yom Kippur are lacking. We read it, Atta Konanta, Amitz Koach, depending if you're Svardi or Ashkenazi. But all we do is read it. We don't observe it. The tshuva we do. You know what Yom Kippur is for us? It's a pale shadow of the mitzvahs that the God gave us in the Torah, of how it was meant to be observed. And the same is true Seder night. What's the heart and soul of the Seder? It all revolves around the Korban Pesach. The Korban Pesach is it. So our Marah we do is a Zecher, it's a rabbinic remembrance, but there's no mitzvah of Marah Midoraisa Bizman Hazeh. Even the Matzah. The Matzah was meant to be eaten. Al Matzah Simrorim Yochluhu is part of a, is a wrap, like the, the Yemenite Matzah, right? You have the, the roasted lamb enveloped by the romaine lettuce, enveloped by the bread, by the, the Matzah bread. That's how the matzah was ideally meant to be eaten. So when you can't have the ideal matzah umrorim yochlu, there's still a mitzvah daraisa of be'erev tochlu matzos. There's still a mitzvah to eat matzah. But it's not, even that's not the ideal. You know, we have a phrase, ikar chaser min hasefer. The whole essence is missing. You know, the whole essence is missing. What the little lady from Wendy say, where is the beef? You know, here, where is the korban pesach? You look at Masech the Psachim. It's, why is it called Psachim, not Masech the Pesach? Because there's two tractates there. Five of the ten Prakim deal with the very phenomenon of Korban Pesach. So we can observe the other parts of Masech the Psachim. Some of the other aspects of Seder, the, of course, not having chametz, removing the chametz from our, the Bittal, the Bedika and the Bittal, that we observe. But half the Masech is missing in terms of practically. What happens? We try to do the best we can Seder night. We try to do the best we can Yom Kippur. But acharei kichlos hakol, after it's all said and done, what do we say? What's our response? L'shona haba Yerushalayim. This is a pale shadow. It's a skeleton of the ideal Seder. It's a skeleton of what, how Yom Kippur is supposed to be observed. But we turn to the Ribbon Sha'olam and say, we've done the best we can. Please accept this pale shadow. Please accept this skeleton and enable us next year to fulfill it in its glory, the way it was meant to be fulfilled, the way you commanded us to fulfill it. We ask God, L'shana habab Yerushalayim, because the lack of a mikdash is felt in its most poignant way, in its most poignant sense, two times a year. The observance of Yom Kippur and the observance of a Seder. This is the idea of L'shana habab Yerushalayim, and that's why, of course, we have the, the minog to say nirza at the end of the Seder. The Ritze. And our final theme, which is going to have many different components to it, many different, because it's a multifaceted theme, is that center, the centerpiece to, to Seder night is the Korban Pesach. And what I'm asking is, what is it that we derive from Korban Pesach? What does a Korban Pesach say to us? And again, uh, you know, you, if you notice on a tobacco product, a pack of cigarettes or a box of cigars, since the time of C. Everett Koop, there's a Surgeon General's warning, right? The Surgeon General's warning on it. This is bad for your health. 
we have, every time we go into Tameh Mitzvahs, we need to give a Surgeon General's warning. Tameh Mitzvahs does not mean why God gave us. We don't know. We're not the Rebona Sha'olam. We're not the Almighty. We don't know why. That you, you can't ask. First of all, because it's, it's a question that's impossible to know. And secondly, it's the nature of God to, to do this. It's not that God has a motivation and then he does something. Human beings function that way. That's the way our neuro, neurological process works. God is a complete unity. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. What is Echad? Complete unity. He's completely one. Doesn't have, you know, motivations and actions and decisions and then fulfilling the decisions. It's the nature of Rebbon Sholem. we always say, to do this, to do that. It's his nature. That's number one. So what is Tam HaMitzvah? Before we get into it, what is it? Tam doesn't mean the reasons behind the mitzvah, as Rabbi Chaim would say, he quoted the, the Tehillim, Ta'amu ra'u, taste. What does it taste like? How do we relate to it? How do we experience the mitzvah? What is it, how does it speak to us? What does it say to us? How does it engage us? The impact the mitzvah has on us. It's not why God gave the mitzvah, it's, it's the what question. Meaning, what does it taste like? That's what we're engaging in. This was, we have a whole Masorah of this. The Chachamim, the Tanayim and Amorayim and the Midrashei Chazal, Medrash Tanchum and Medrash Rabbah. We have the great medievalists, Rabbi Pinchas Halevi and the Sefer Achinuch, the Rambam, the Sefer Mitzvahs. And we have this in the moderns, Rav Hirsch and Chorev, the Rav Zetzal and the Shurim that he gave. How do we experience, how do we relate to the mitzvah? So when it comes to the Korban Pesach, we're going to discuss three ideas. There are more, but three primary ideas. One is in the Meshach Chachma and Parshas Baloscha. In, the, in Parshas Baloscha, when, by Korban Sheni, by the Pesach Sheni, you have this concept. He develops it, many others do. That's the theme of Bittal of Odazara. What was the lamb? The lamb was something that was deified, was worshipped by the Mitzri. Just to give you an example, an, 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 an analogy. What was the beginning of the system of the Makos, of the plagues? The first three plagues attacked what? That which the Egyptians deified, that which was, they defined as reality. To show that the Nile River was no different than any other body of water, turning it into blood, and whether it's Svardaya or crocodiles, or whether they're frogs, most assume it's frogs, but whether it's frogs or crocodiles, that instead of the, the Nile being a source of, of life and protection and, and all of the positives of how they worshipped it, it showed what the Nile was. It's a body of water like anything else. And it can be smitten and defeated, it can be attacked, and it can serve as a source of attack. Well, what's the lamb? The lamb is something that the Egyptians deified. We took the lamb, Bittal of Odazara, what did we do? We broke the identification with the Egyptian deity. How do we break that identification? Take it, slaughter it. And by the way, four days in advance, the Egyptians knew it was that was going to happen. And we're demonstrating to the Egyptians. And by the way, we roasted it. You can smell roasted meat. You know, think about the, the scent, the fragrance of roast. You know, that's the difference between just cooking or salting or smoking as opposed to roasting something. So it's in front of them, we demonstrated that this is nothing more than any other animal. It's no different than any other mammal. What does that do? Before you can go and create a covenant with the Almighty, you have to separate, remove yourself, and avoid what? All the corruption of, of, of the false notions of a society. You have to break yourself and wean yourself from those corrupt false notions. And you have to do it in a demonstrative way. Slaughtering the lamb, treating it like any other animal. Roasting it, taking it like any other animal and using it as a vehicle and relating to the Almighty. It's the source of the Seder as opposed to something which is an object of worship. The second idea is not the bittal of Odazara, the breaking of the identification with the Egyptian deity, but it's what? It's breaking the mentality of fear and intimidation. The Chizkuni, the famous Provencal Rishon, talks about this. Look at the mitzvahs of Korban Pesach. We talked about roasting it. It's the one korban that has to be roasted. Again, what's accomplished by roasting it? The whole world can smell it. You, when you roast it, you can't keep that fragrance in. That just, it, it spreads. What is the idea of tying it up to the bedpost four days in advance? You tie it up to the bedpost. What's that? You know what it's like to have an animal tied up like that? 
bad, bad. That, that lamb is going to, those lambs are going to be making noise. You better believe. It's not like they're out in the pasture grazing quietly. The fact that it's tied up to a bedpost and wants to move and, and run around like any other animal, it's going to be making a lot of noise. So the Egyptians are going to hear that. And the whole idea of the four days. And it says, it says, mishchu ukechu. Those of you who have, take. You know, take, draw your own, bring them in and use your own. Those of you who don't, buy them. You're going to be going to Egyptians who worship this thing, buying it. And they're saying, well, like, why all of a sudden are you buying it? People don't buy lambs. It's an object of worship. It's not something that people buy. Oh, yeah, we're, we're going to slaughter it in four days, and then we're going to roast it, and we're going to eat it. What was the point? Psychologically, the Jews had to break that mentality of fear, that mentality of intimidation that they had for the Egyptians, for the Mitzrim. And that is done by taking the Egyptian god and treating it like an animal. And that's done not in a quiet, secretive way. It's done what? In a very public way, where the Egyptians hear it, smell it, know what's happening. So breaking the mentality of fear and intimidation. That's the second theme that you have in Korban Pesach. Tamei HaMitzvos. The role of the breaking of the identification of Avodah Zarah, of the object of the Egyptian worship. The role of breaking the mentality of fear and intimidation. Number three, and this is really crucial. Number three is creating the value and culture of family. Family, and to a greater extent, community. We'll get to the word community in a minute or two. But what's the idea of what they did with Korban Pesach? Sele base avo sele bias. You know, when you're a slave, the whole notion of a slave doesn't have yichus, doesn't have genealogy. You know, you're, you're, you're owned, you're property. You're, you, even your children, all you are is a, you're like an animal who breeds. You know, you breed and you produce an asset for the master, for the owner. The whole notion in Judaism, and look at how we started our religion. The beginning of this religion is what? What was the ultimate sanctuary? The family. The lamb for each family. Family comes together. You're no longer these individual assets. You're no longer like these, these breeding objects that are used for masters. You're a family. You're a family. And a family has a meal together. And what happens at that meal? It's a teaching experience. It's an educational experience. Grandparents to children, grandparents to, the, to, to the, their children, to their grandchildren. It's, it's generations. It's the bridging of generations. The ultimate sanctuary, the ultimate base of Mikdash in Yiddishkeit is the Jewish home, is the bias, is the base avos, is the family. And that was defined for us at the very moment of our inception. It's taking the experience of a meal, a meal which could be so mundane, could be so instinctual, could be so social, and it's taking that instinctual social moment and sublimating it, channeling it and sublimating it for what purpose? For the purpose of Avodas Hashem, for the purpose of, of creating an educational moment, an educational experience, a rendezvous. What do we say? Go back to the Halach Ma'anya. Called Dichvin Yesei Veyecho, called Ditzrich Yesei Veyivsach. If you're hungry, come and join our Seder. If you, don't, if you don't, can't afford to be part of a lamb, then you come into ours. What's the idea there? The family is not just defined biologically. It's not just the biological family, the Jewish family. The Jewish family is defined by what? A place for the needy a place for those who don't have on their own. Going back to the Rambam's categories, those who are depressed, those who can't afford it, those who may not know on their own. What is the family? The family is, is, is not a biological entity, it's a communal entity. But that's the, that's the core of Judaism. Va'asudli mikdash v'shachanti besocham. That God resides in our midst. When? When we're looking after each other, when we're educating each other when we relate to God through the context of a family. That's the nucleus in Yiddishkeit. And what happened at Seder? Seder was a night where we were responsible for others. It's not just, you know, well, you know, um, my last name is Weil, right? The Wiles. No, no, no. The, fa the, the Seder is, is opened up and, and we extend the Seder and we bring others in. That's what a Jewish family is. 
It's an institution of chesed. It's not this elite institution. It's an institution of chesed. What is the idea of min ha That you can't partake of a seder unless you're part of that Korban Pesach beforehand. So it's not some ad hoc, you know, oh, you want to come, come on over. No, we go out and we invite guests. We use the, the, the family, we use the meal as what? Is we treat it in a serious way. We sublimate it and we use it as a teaching experience, as, as, as a religious experience. An Evid can't invite guests. An Evid, is, his time is not his own time. Her time is not her own time. It's the, it's the master's time. It's, it's on the time of the Lord. No, I don't mean the Almighty. I'm talking about the master, the Adon. Not so the Seder night. What are we told? Now that the time is our time, we're also taught the ability to do what? To be sensitive to time moments. Korban Pesach has to eat and be eaten before chatzos. There's a time requirement, so there's a sensitivity to time, that experience. But as well, the Evid now is, how do we demonstrate our, our freedom? We demonstrate our freedom by doing the kinds of acts of chesed that we couldn't do as slaves. We demonstrate our, our freedom by bringing others in, by inviting guests in. Binurenu vizkeinenu nelech. The Pharaoh would not allow the Jews to go out for the Shabbaton. He wouldn't allow them to go with Moshe to the Midbar. Why? Because in Egypt, you know who worshiped? The, the priests worship. What do you mean, your children and your elderly? Baloney. No, not so. In Judaism, relating to God, it's a family affair. Binurenu vizkeinenu, with our young and with our elderly. Everyone participates. We don't do it via proxy. Everyone is a participant. This is also part of the experience of, this, of the Korban Pesach, creating the family as the center, as the nucleus, as the fulcrum of the religious experience. And then a few last points that you don't necessarily have to link to the Korban Pesach, but that is that the experience of, of the Korban Pesach, the experience of, of our freedom, was an experience that inculcated values. Our freedom, our beginning, our inception, was an inception that the way the Ribbono Sha'olam, the way the Almighty set it up, it inculcated values. Simple example. This mitzvah that you have in Parshas Bo, that they were not allowed to leave their home. Mi Pesach Al you cannot leave your home. What is that? Why is that so crucial that they couldn't leave the home the Seder night? In the Rav Zatzal and Rav Aaron Soloveitchik in his book speak about this. Look at, I mean, just to give an example, look at what's happening now in Libya. I think the best example is the Bolshevik Revolution. With all the hypocrisies and atrocities that were perpetrated by the, by the Tsar and the Tsar's family, didn't compare to the horrific actions of the Bolshevik Revolution. It's true of the French Revolution. The revolution of the peasants. Who was worse, Marie Antoinette or the, or, the, or the French Revolution, the peasants of the Revolution? And you can give many examples. Look at what's happened in what used to be Rhodesia. Look at Zimbabwe today. What's the point? You don't want to have that which demarcates and defines our emancipation, our freedom, is a night when Jewish men are going to go and we're going to fix those Egyptians. We go rape the Egyptian girls and women and we break into their stores and we burn their homes and we kill them. That cannot be the definition of our, of our emancipation. And so often, and we see it now in what they call the Arab Spring, the Arab, I don't know, Spring is a bad word, but we see what's happening in countries there. We, we, we see what's ha we've, we've seen it in Africa, we've seen it in Russia, we've seen it all over the world. Shlomo HaMelech says it best. For three phenomena, the earth trembles, the, the world quakes or shakes. One of them is Al Eved Sheyimloch. Say for Mishle, Al Eved Sheyimloch. Woe when the, ma when the servant, when the slave becomes the master. Watch out. That wasn't going to happen with the Jewish people. It would be a night of dignity, a night of gratitude to the Almighty, not a night of raping and pillaging and killing. What was the first mitzvah they were given that, that Moshe and Aaron were commanded to teach the Jews? Shiluach Avadim, labor laws. The very, very preparation for our freedom is that we are not going to treat our employees the way we were treated. 
How often does it happen that the abused child becomes an abusive parent? That the abused employee, when that person becomes in a position of, of leadership, becomes abusive? We all know it too well. That's not going to be the case with the Jews. The Jews are going to be educated that just because you were abused and oppressed, don't do to others what was done to you. And that's why, to start, before we would be worthy of our emancipation and redemption, what are we taught first? Labor laws, shiluach havadim. In these and others, there are many, many side themes that are associated with the experience of Pesach Mitzrayim, with the experience of that infamous night, that, that unique, special, wondrous night in Jewish history of the 15th. So just to review, we had five themes. Halach, Ma'anya, the role that it plays, it defines for us and gives us an insight into what is Simchas Yom Tov all about. We talked about the idea of, of, of re-experiencing. It's our exodus. It's our emancipation, re-experiencing the, the exodus of Egypt, reliving it. It's, it's not a history lesson. And with all the halachic uh, aspects of that in the Hashkafa as well. We spoke about the role that Kriyas Yamsuf plays, that even though the Rambam doesn't have it, what's the logic of our Haggadah, of the Chachmei HaMesor that incorporated Kriyas Yamsuf into Seder? We spoke about why Lishana Habab Yerushalayim. It only shows up two times, after Yom Kippur and after the Seder. What, what, is it, what are we saying and why are we saying Lishana Habab next year in Jerusalem? And then, of course, the significance of the Korban Pesach, the Bittal of Odazara, the breaking of the identification of the Egyptian deity, the breaking of the mentality of fear and intimidation from our former captors in order that psychologically it would prepare us to be free people and the creating of values, the creating of a family, and the role of the family, and what does it mean to a family of chesed, not just a biological family. All of that through the mitzvahs and halachas of Karb and Pesach, as well as some of the inculcation of values that come from not being able to leave our home that night, and the role of teaching of the shiluach avadim, the labor laws. I want to wish everyone a wonderful and meaningful Pesach, a Pesach that we can experience, that we can live, and inculcate in ourselves the values that the Almighty has given us through that great moment in history that lives, that's alive and well in each and every family, in each and every community, in each and every generation. And ultimately we say, Lishana Habba Yerushalayim. We should be able to observe it in its fullest sense in Jerusalem. Thank you.